So about me, uh, I am a virtual production supervisor at Smash Virtual Studios. I am a virtual production supervisor at Smash Virtual Studios, uh, which is a new virtual production studio opening in the South Loop in just a few weeks, actually. Uh, it'll be, the, as far as we know, the largest standing LED volume, uh, certainly in Chicago, um, maybe in the Midwest by some metric. Um, I'm also a hardware and software developer at a company called Lowled Virtual, um, and I have developed hardware and software that's used on hundreds of studios all around the world for camera tracking and metadata um, and lens tracking as well. I'm also a consultant to numerous companies within that space. Uh, before this, I worked in special effects, like practical effects, and I was a prop builder and I ran a special effects house here in Chicago called Madly Effects, um, where I built all sorts of random things. Among them, I had a specialty in electronics and LEDs, so I spent a lot of time building d certainly dozens, maybe hundreds of LED effects for various TV shows and movies throughout the years. I'm actually going to be having a class on that tomorrow as well. So I have an interesting background in that I uh, have a strong understanding of sort of the fundamentals of LEDs at a bare circuit board level. And so when I started getting into virtual production several years ago, um, you know, LED panels are kind of like the ultimate LED light, right? They are insane when you see them in person, as you can see at the resolution booth. Um, and I wanted to learn more about them. And as I started learning more about them, I started realizing that there are specifications within them and ways that they are designed that directly affect how they look on camera. And that those things may not always be in line with what the manufacturer's uh, goals are. So why did I want to teach this class? Um, Luckily, uh, every year, Ned and Gary say, what do you want to teach? And this time I said, I want to talk about circuits. Um, <laughs> so, but this has come from some real world advice. Uh, LED panels and LED video walls, are, they're not film equipment, right? We all work in the film industry, and when you deal with a piece of film equipment, you have certain expectations for performance and reliability, um, certain standards that you expect it to meet. And LED walls, they don't come from our industry. They come from a completely different industry, which is like staging and concerts and signage, things like that. And so they don't have the same standards that we have. Um, and because of that, LED panel vendors and the manufacturers, they often don't know what we need on film sets. Um, and vice versa, the crew often doesn't know what they should be looking for in LED panels. A lot of people just assume that, oh, it's a big screen. They're kind of all the same. Um, and that's simply not true, and uh, this has resulted in very expensive mistakes. And I've seen this, b again, both ways. I've seen um, studios buy LED panels, spend a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases, and it turns out that they, they didn't know how to test them properly, or how to evaluate them properly, and uh, they just didn't perform as they were hoping or that they needed to. And the reason that this can happen as well is because, like I said, the vendors don't necessarily know that they need to, that there are specs that they need to be telling us that they, uh, they aren't telling us necessarily. Not necessarily out of malice, although, you know, who knows, maybe. Um, but out of just negligence. They don't, they don't know yet because this is such a new industry to everyone. They don't necessarily know. So uh, in this first part, uh, we're going to talk about how to control millions of LEDs, right? There's a ton of LED lights here at the show. So what makes an LED video wall different from those? Well, the big one is that they have a crap ton of LEDs on them. Even, you know, like the addressable LED panels that we, we use for lighting only have a few different sort of subsections, whereas a single 2.6 millimeter pitch LED tile, it's only 192 by 192 pixels, which, you know, it's like an animated GIF, right? But even that is over 36,000 individual pixels, which is quite a lot. And that means that you have 110,000 control lines because it's RGB, so you need to control each of those. So, and, that, and this is just a foot and a half by a foot and a half. It's a single panel. So if you scale that across an entire stage, you're talking about an insane amount of I.O. and control required to uh, individually illuminate all of these pixels, right? And each one of those pixels, it's not, it's not pulling a lot of current, right? It might be pulling 15, 20 milliamps at max, but it's still a lot when you scale it up to this insane amount. So how do we do that? Well, uh, on the left here, I have a picture of a Threadripper CPU, which is one of the biggest CPUs that you can buy you know, in the world. And even that only has about 4,000 pins. So you can see that there's no, we have never any hope of possibly addressing every pixel on an LED panel from individual pins on a microcontroller or a microprocessor or an FPGA. So we have to use LED drivers. And an LED driver is just a chip. 
you know, it's like a black blob chip like you'd see in a circuit board. Um, and this is actually a pretty accurate animated GIF that I just kind of randomly found. Um, and it basically, it uses something called multiplexing. And you can, can multiplex LEDs to control a lot of them with a relatively small amount of pins. Um, this is combined with, you know, I, I showed the Threadripper CPU earlier. Obviously, we're not using CPUs to drive them. We're using something called FPGAs, field, field programmable gate arrays, which have, uh, they're basically programmable hardware. And so you can control sections of the screen in uh, parallel. That's really the advantage of the FPGA, is you get a lot of parallelism out of the system. So there's a couple things that you should note about this GIF. First of all, it's scanning row by row. And that is kind of a key thing here. So if you consider this, everything down here, to be one of the chips, one of the driver chips, um, you can see that it has, uh, it's scanning row by row, and that there's a ratio. There's a ratio of this one chip is controlling this amount of LEDs, which is 16 in this case. And so this, uh, this can be described as a spec called the scan rate, sometimes called the multiplexing rate, sometimes called the scan way. Um, and this is the ratio of LED drivers to LEDs within the circuitry of the LED panels themselves. Um, and this is something that it affects the flicker, it affects the brightness, and it affects the, res the refresh speed of the panel. And it's really interesting because they, LED manufacturers are, uh, how should I put it? They, they want to build panels with higher scan rates. They want to use fewer chips because it costs less and it's easier to build panels that have, that have fewer chips. Unfortunately, that increases the scan rate. And as we just saw, you can only control one row at a time. So what that means is that when you kind of break it down, if, a, if you have a very high scan rate, in other words, a, a lot of LEDs being controlled by a small amount of chips, any, at any given moment in time, there isn't a large portion of the wall actually illuminated. Um, if you can sort of work backwards, if you said, okay, what if we had one chip per LED, it would be insane. And those panels do exist for like outdoor high bright screens and things like that. But um, they would uh, not flicker at all, right? The entire screen would be lit up at any given moment in time. So it's an interesting trade-off there. And we're starting to see manufacturers, they are aware of this, obviously. So this is a particularly interesting um, product lineup here from this manufacturer because they have a 2.3 millimeter pitch, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, screen, as well as a 2.3E, which the difference you can see here, this one is a 6 scan and this one is an 18 scan. Again, that's a 1 to 6 ratio or 1 to 18 ratio. And so they have two different products that are ostensibly identical, but the scan rate is different. And what that means is that the one in the middle is probably going to be two to three times as expensive because it's more LEDs, it's more chips, um, but it's going to perform significantly better on camera. Um, it, the, anything beyond sort of a 1 to 16 scan, you're starting to roll the dice a little bit. Um, the six scan is obviously going to be like you're going to be able to sort of roll up and know, okay, it's just going to perform really well on camera. We're not going to get any flicker, and I'll show you exactly uh, what I mean in a second. Another thing that it affects though is the brightness, because if you imagine, if you take a frame, you know, for a fixed sort of refresh rate of the screen, um, if only one section of the pixels are lit up, well, you have that sort of time budget, right? You have the time budget of one frame to show to scan across the entire screen, and so if you have a high scan rate. That means that the pixels are lit up for a smaller amount of time, which means that they're not as bright. And so uh, I don't think in this spec sheet it showed it very well, but you can actually see a notable difference where uh, lower scan screens will be brighter. Um, and then the other thing here that I mentioned earlier is that manufacturers will sometimes conveniently leave things off of the spec sheet. So for example, the, the 1.9. There's no mention about the scan, the scan rate in this, uh, this year panel. Um, it's nowhere on the spec sheet to be found. Now, they have an incentive to sell that because it's more expensive. And yeah, it's a sharper panel. It's going to look nicer. But when I see that, I get scared. They're not telling us a key specification that we need, um, again, either through, you know, either on purpose or not. Maybe they don't think that it's necessary when uh, for us it absolutely is. Um, and this is, again, this is sort of like a freeze frame. If you were to like, take a freeze frame of any LED video wall, this is kind of how they scan. And so you can see um, how it's, it's row by row, like we said. But then if you look at the six scan, 
it's it, it's interesting because you we tend to think in terms of rolling shutter with cameras, right? You start from the bottom, you, you scan to the bottom, and that's your image. With video walls, it's it's sort of sub uh, sub rolling shutter within that essentially. So you can see that the modules here have multiple scan rows going down at the same time. And you might look at the one on the left and say, well, that is more akin to a rolling shutter. That's, that might be more ideal. But it's actually just one module that we're looking at. You have to consider the context of the entire screen. And so again, it's about how much of the screen is lit up at any given point. And uh, I think the next slide is this, is, this is this in animation, right? So again, thinking about rolling shutter, you, you might look at that <laughs> and you might say, how the heck? Do you synchronize that to a rolling shutter, right? If you have an imager that's scanning from top to bottom for an entire frame, and you have a wall that's scanning multiple times, in multiple uh, rows across the screen at every, any given point across the frame, how do you synchronize that? And the answer is, well, you kind of don't. Um, you can obviously gen lock everything. You run everything at the same refresh rate. but it really depends. There are systems like, that's not a particularly exciting uh, slide there. There are systems like uh, Brompton uh, Processing has a, a system called ShutterSync that will change the refresh rate of the wall to more uh, closely approximate what the camera is shooting with the shutter. However, it's still not ideal. And it's not a catch-all. It's, it's not something that will save you in every situation. Um, at the end of the day, we are fundamentally trying to synchronize two things kind of can't be synchronized. And so it's all a game of how good is good enough. Um, something that you'll notice, you know, if you're doing your own tests and evaluations, you'll notice this um, during vertical moves. So if you're tilting up and down, if you're um, craning the camera up and down on a jib, you'll notice scan lines that I'll show you in a second. Um, and that's your, these sort of sub-missynchronization issues. Um, depending on the processor, and I, you know, I've been told this from uh, LED panel manufacturers that gen locking the processor is clocking the content. It's not necessarily clocking the refresh rate of the panels to the camera. And so you can still have, and you can see, um, and you'll see in spec sheets, oh, these panels are rated for 38, 40 hertz. These panels are rated for 7,000 hertz or something like that. Um, it's not necessarily that you're clocking that down to the camera's uh, shutter speed when you're, when you're gen locking everything together. It's more just that you're clocking the content, and you're sort of hoping that this works itself out. And that's where situations like shutter sync from Brompton can really save you um, in, in those types of situations. However, again, it's not, it's not ideal. It's not, it's not perfect. So this is why I always say you have to do testing. You have to make sure that you are constantly shooting tests. You have to make sure that you are evaluating the panels on their own merit. Um, because there will be certain camera and panel combinations that simply don't work for what you're doing. Now, it's also situational. Because if you're not doing any extreme moves, well, maybe you won't see these artifacts. Um, maybe if it's, a, uh, if it's a lower contrast or a darker scene, they can be more obvious than if it's a brighter scene as well. So again, how good is good enough? Something else that I didn't mention here, um, but the scan rate also does affect the refresh rate of the screen. So um, this is. It's not so relevant to us, right? This is more, I would say, relevant to like sports because we're typically not shooting at a at a one four thousandth shutter, right? But if you are, you the the lower scan rate can give you higher refresh rates, which can make things easier for you. Um, this is a this is a little video that I I found, and this is just showing just what these artifacts look like, right? And you'll notice they kind of move with the camera, especially as it goes vertical. And again, I want to reiterate, there is no perfect solution to it. There's no, like, oh, this setting needs to be changed, or this setting needs to be locked. Like, we are, you're dealing with two things that are refreshing in fundamentally different ways. So you really have to consider, uh, you know, how, how are these things refreshing, and are these tiles delivering the performance that we need? And again, the, the higher scan rate tiles will be cheaper. Um, and in some cases, to achieve the finer pixel pitches, they have to be higher scan rates because there's not enough room on the circuit boards in order to actually cram uh, enough drivers to make the scan rates high enough. And so it, it is this sort of give and take where you can have really fine pixel pitch screens, sub two millimeter pitch screens that look beautiful. They're sharp, um, but you're going to have trade-offs. 
they're not going to be as bright. Almost always, they're not going to be as bright. Um, and they will tend to have more artifacts like this. Um, there's also something interesting that we'll talk about later. Where the, final pixel, the finer the pixel pitches are, it's not necessarily indicative of the on-camera performance you're going to get when it comes to Moray. There's another factor as well to consider. Um, we're going to dive into some LEDs, specifically about LEDs. So LEDs um, are very spiky emission sources, right? You have a red LED, it emits red light. Uh, if you have green LED, it's green light and so on. And this can cause problems. So uh, ProLight, right over there, um, and Aerie, obviously with the Orbiter, um, are introducing this idea of like RGB ACL lights, which help to broaden the spectrum and create more accurate colors. And I think this, I think I stole this from ProLight, actually, this little <laughs> comparison down here. But this leads to a whole, a whole host of problems, right? LED video walls are, I mean, they haven't been used as light sources very much until very recently. And so color has not necessarily been something that manufacturers have been considering until very recently. Um, and any RGB, pure RGB light source is going to give you color inaccuracies and problems. Um, when, when LED light fixtures first came out, um, you know, 10 years ago now probably, we had these issues. We had color casts. We had, um, you know, inaccuracies. Everyone remembers, you know, oh, these lights shift green, these lights shift magenta, that sort of thing. And at this point, we've kind of taken for granted that the research and the money has gone into it to fix these problems, to make them perform really well in general. But uh, LED video walls are kind of like going back to the Stone Age in that sense where the color that you're getting from them is not accurate necessarily and it can't necessarily be trusted. And this can cause specific issues like metamorism. So metamorism is this, this idea that if you have an object, if you have an object that, it, that um, reflects a very narrow wavelength, so in this case red, and you shine a very narrow wavelength on it, it can either completely disappear or it can, com or it can appear um, a completely different color um, such as black, for example, or it can appear unusually vibrant or unusually dull because the ratios are all wrong, right? Your, the idea is that uh, in real life, a continuous spectrum of light, the, you know, the ratio of red to blue to green is not one-third to one-third to one-third as it is from an RGB source. And so this unusual emphasis of all this light, it appears white, but it is only RGB, uh, can cause unusual issues with color. And this is a problem with us for obvious reasons. Skin tones are sort of chief among them. But also, if you are doing a product shoot and you have a client who has a product, they want to see their colors represented accurately. And you may not get that if you're planning on using a pure RGB source to illuminate your scene. This is why, um, you know, I know that there's a, I've seen online, like people will say, oh, you know, this is great because it makes our lighting so much faster. We can use the panels as lights. And you can, but they're really good for sort of ambient fill lights. They're good for the bounced light around the environment. You shouldn't rely on them as keys. Um, they're, at this point, they're not suitable for that. Now, they know this. The LED panel manufacturers know this. They're working on more color accurate lights. Um, it's going to take a long time to get there, but hopefully we will get there. Another limitation when you're talking about shooting on video walls is moray. And this is something that comes up really a lot. This is something that is uh, very commonly talked about. And uh, there's this idea when it comes to moray of pixel pitch versus fill factor. So pixel pitch is like the headline feature for any video wall, right? When you, when you rent or you buy a video wall, you're getting a 1.9 millimeter pitch screen, a 2.3, 2.6 millimeter pitch screen. That is like the thing that they market it as. And there is, uh, as we learned earlier, hopefully, the inverse relationships between things like pixel pitch and brightness and flicker. Um, but one of the great advantages of the fine pitch screens is they are sharper. And because they have more pixels, you can shoot closer to them. However, um, I had a very interesting conversation with a, with a tile manufacturer last week where they were telling me about some tests that they did. And uh, it's not the case that it is just as easy as saying, oh, this is a 1.3 pitch. It's going to give you the. It's going to give you much better performance than a, you know, 2.6 millimeter pitch. Um, there is fill factor. So the fill factor is just the ratio of the emitting to the non-emitting surface area. And all that that means is if you were to tally up the surface area of this of this 
panel and count, you know, in square inches or whatever, the amount of surface area that is actually emitting light versus not emitting light. That's your fill factor. Now, the interesting thing about fill factor is that it's not really a spec that is sort of revealed. I've never seen a, a fill factor spec on a data sheet. Manufacturers are aware of it. Some of them have measured it, but again, it's not necessarily been relevant until very recently with virtual production. And so, um, you know, hopefully we'll get to this point where they'll start to sort of consider this, but it does sort of go against a lot of the, uh, the, the common knowledge that we sort of think about now when it comes to Moray. So, um, this, is just a, this is just a close up, extreme close up macro shot of uh, an LED tile, and I think just seeing this probably clarifies a lot of things, um, but you can see that they are in, indeed, in this case, individual uh, two millimeter by two millimeter LEDs um, soldered close together. Um, so when it comes to fill factor, again, you don't get anything for free, right? There's inverse relationships everywhere. There's, there's good and bad to everything. So this is four different tiles of different pixel pitches, um, and actually different technologies as well, which I'll talk about in a sec. But you'll notice that the finer pitch tiles will actually have a lower fill factor. And so what that means is that you, you might expect them, you know, a, a tile of a three millimeter pitch versus a two millimeter pitch to perform twice as good, or I guess a one and a half millimeter pitch to perform twice as good. When you actually do the tests, in many cases, that's not what you see. It's, it's better, for sure, but it's not necessarily twice as good like you'd expect, and a lot of that comes down to fill factor. But another thing is you'll notice the black levels of all of these screens is wildly different, right? Um, and the one on the bottom right appears really black and really dark, which is great. Um, that means that the contrast ratio should be really high. But there's trade-offs to that as well. So the, uh, the darker screens um, tend to, uh, how should I put this? They, they have lower, uh, they'll tend to have lower viewing angles. So for example, the one on the bottom right is using something called flip chip technology, which means that the, the LEDs are actually on the reverse of the, uh, circuit board. They're actually shining through holes in the circuit board. What that means is that you get this really gray black level, but they have almost no off-axis viewing angles because you're looking essentially through a hole through the circuit board. And so you get this weird effect where you look dead straight on, it's great, really sharp, really bright, and then as soon as you go any off-axis, you're going to lose it. Um, but you get this really great black level. Now conversely, the one on the bottom left here is a 2.6 uh, millimeter pitch panel. It might be 2.8. And you can see that it appears a lot brighter. And it is a lot brighter. And what that means is that it's going to be more susceptible to ambient light and to studio light hitting it and affecting its image. But um, it's going to have better viewing angles. And it is uh, going to be brighter in general because of that lower scan rate. Um, this is, what is this? It's another video. One of the things as well to consider is when it comes to the intrinsic brightness or the darkness, the blackness of the wall itself, is that you are dealing with LEDs. And LEDs are, I mean, they're plastic, right? The walls are essentially made of plastic. And plastic is reflective. And so this is something that a lot of people just don't consider. Um, but getting any sort of light on these video walls will affect them. And it will cause hot spots. And it will cause uh, spill and streaks. And so this is just you know, in a dark room shining a flashlight on this. Um, and I think it's often surprising to people how much ambient light and studio lighting can affect the image that you get on here. And again, this is something that's really hard to fix in post because it's, it's not even. It's not like, oh, all of the shadows are lifted. It is more like this section of the screen is lifted or this, you know, piece has a streak across it. And because you're dealing with something that is fundamentally granular and the way it's emitting, uh, it can be very difficult to fix in post. Um, you know, not necessarily just a power window. Um, I wanted to go back here. So we could talk a little bit more about color here. Um, one of the interesting things that I find about uh, video walls is they will wear. So if you have a scene that is, let's say you, you, know, you have a shoot that's like sunset, right? You're going to be using more of like the red and, the, and uh, uh, you know, the red LEDs. And so those are going to wear more. And so over time, you can actually get color shifts and different phenomenon where you'll, your screens will err on the side of particular colors. Or, you know, if, if it's, I guess if it's white, they can just 
be dimmer overall. Um, and so that's something to watch out for, especially if you're getting like a rental screen, um, because it oftentimes the, they'll sometimes mix and match the panels, and you can uh, get unusual, uh, uh, you know, not not very even color. Um, you can correct some of that in like the processor. But it's not necessarily possible in some cases because you're talking about, you know, the such the, you know the the elements that the screen is made out of physically wearing down. Um, you can also uh, with the color space coverage is another thing to consider, right? Cameras nowadays can see a, like huge color gamuts. You know, um, the the manufacturers of cameras put a lot of time and effort into. Um, making their cameras see accurate color, but also as many colors as possible. And video walls really don't display them. They can get uh, close in some cases. We're seeing screens that can do Rec 2020. We're seeing screens that can do P3. But even a P3 color space is going to be a lot less than what a, an Aerie camera is capable of seeing, or what you know any cinema camera is capable of seeing. Um, again, this is something that is just going to take time. Color accuracy is one of those things that you know, until again, until very recently, these these screens have not been used, and in a situation where they're being analyzed as critically as they are now. So the manufacturers are just now kind of coming up to speed with our needs and our requirements. Um, but um, you can often drive them at 10-bit, 12-bit, even. Um, it's going to that will affect your latency, but it's not um, it's not impossible as well, which is actually kind of nice. Um, I'll go back here. So one of the other things to, to consider when you're talking about this GIF that has not set it not to play. Let's do this. There we go. Um, you might say, OK, well, this is only 16 LEDs, right? So how do we control an entire screen? Well, you just duplicate this circuit. That's essentially what it is. And so if you duplicate this horizontally, that's how you get the, your sort of full scan width. And then if you duplicate this vertically, that's how you get these sort of multiple scan sections. So um, it, it's, it's interesting looking at the data sheets. I looked at a bunch of data sheets for drivers in preparation for this. And they're all, they're all very much like, oh, you know, we've built these for the, the new highest scan rate LED panels. And the demands of the industry are, are finer pitches and, and higher scan rates. And uh, you know, me reading that just cringing horribly because it's, uh, I <laughs> it's not necessarily what we need always. Um, yeah. So, you know, this was not a very, uh, I, d I only had like 19 slides here, but I just wanted to sort of run through some things. But if anybody has any questions about um, either this or virtual production uh, camera synchronization in general, you know, I'm happy to, happy to go through some stuff. Um, I didn't think that this was going to be a huge, what did do for you? Ah, I didn't think this was going to be a huge talk. I only had about 19 slides. But there are some of these things that, are not very evident. And they're these things that people don't necessarily think about um, because they don't know. And the manufacturers don't know that we care about as well. Um, but I just wanted to shed some light on. Any questions about LED panels, cameras, synchronization? We can talk about metadata, whatever. Hi, Andy. Um, just a quick question. Um, this is more just about uh, that came to me for just virtual production in general. But um, for, in regards to, say, camera tracking, there are a lot of products out right now. Do you have any um, thoughts on the, all the different products that are coming out and like which ones you're, like, say, you are leaning towards or you th are interested in or like you would recommend or something? I don't know. Yeah. Just different camera tracking um, methods. At the end of the day, when it comes to when it comes to camera tracking, there's kind of two schools of thought. There's what works in a broadcast TV studio, and then there's what works for like film, in my mind. And the thing is that virtual production for film hasn't existed until very recently. So there really are no products right now specifically for that market. Um, there's, you know, a, a, we've been using what essentially repurposed motion capture systems, right? So we've been using OptiTrack or Vicon typically for, for that sort of thing. Um, 
and they work. And Abstract has just now come out with a uh, product specifically for virtual production. Um, but these other companies like uh, like Moses Stipe um, are very established within this space. Now the downside with them is that they're very limited in kind of what you can do in terms of camera movements, and camera angles. They have certain requirements of the space. Um, but you know they're rock solid. They're designed to be rock solid. They're designed to work at a TV studio constantly. There's also um, inside out tracking systems like NCAM, for example, um, or real sense based systems like uh, the vanishing point vector. And those are also good. Um, they get confused with LED walls, is really the, the downside with those. So it's not necessarily something that we can really consider. The Vive Mars just came out recently, which is a very interesting product. Uh, it's about a $5,000 virtual production tracking system that uses the Vive Lighthouse technology. And I'm biased because I worked with them on integrating my lens encoders uh, into it. Um, so I think it's fantastic. But uh, it, is an, it is a really interesting sort of interim step because it gives you for five grand a pretty you know, decent uh, little tracking system. Um, I think what we're going to need to see in the future is we need to see systems that work in infrared so they can work on LED stages um, and that ha give you more freedom so that you are not limited in terms of camera placements, you're not limited in terms of where I can put markers. They're designed to be moved around, designed to be constantly recalibrated. Um, and uh, I don't know of any in the works just yet, but I'm sure that we will get there. The other thing that we need to think about is that you know, we're still a fairly small subset of of the virtual production market. The the TV news broadcast and event industries are um, still the largest consumers of it. And so that's where a lot of yeah, and so that's where a lot of uh, the resources are still being poured. But we'll get there. So if you have a DP that comes to you and says, you know, I keep hearing about virtual production. I know it's the next best thing. Uh, what are the top five things I need to know when I start adapting my workflow from being a traditional DP to now walking into a, an established volume? What do I have to worry about? Top five, huh? Well, um, I mean, obviously it changes everything about pre-production. You know, I, I've, I've had conversations with, with clients who are like, oh, you know, um, I don't know about needing to figure out everything ahead of time. And, you know, we're used to working on green screen and doing everything in VFX. Why do we have to figure everything out ahead of time? To which the response is, well, it's called filmmaking, um, where you plan things out and then you shoot them. So, um, that sometimes gets a laugh and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, they, uh, you, you do have to consider things ahead of time versus, you know, just say, oh, we'll fix it in post. We'll shoot everything on green screen and we'll, we'll let the, uh, we'll let the VFX people sort it out later. But you do also do need to reconsider. It does touch on pretty much every aspect of production. It affects production design because now you're talking about um, how much of the set can we build virtually as opposed to physically and how do we integrate those elements together. You're talking about it affecting lighting because the screens can be used as an ambient light source. You can use fewer lights. Um, and you need to, the lights that you do put up, you need to really consider your placement about them so that, as I mentioned before, you're not hitting the screen. You're not illuminating the screen uh, too much. So there are a number of things to consider, but I think the beautiful thing is there isn't like a major thing. There isn't like, oh, you know, that, that thing that you, you do that you really love doing, you can't do that anymore. It's, it's pretty much just new things to learn, which I think is, the, the people that I enjoy working with find that sort of thing exciting. Um, so uh, that's what I would say. Um, could you speak a bit to how virtual production um, changes the relationship with like some of the post-production team and what that process is like now that they may be on set with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we have a lot more data now, right? So we can record like pretty much anything. We record the camera data as well as the camera's position in space. Now I will say even the best camera tracking systems are not going to be able to replace a good match move. A good match move, you're talking about something that is sub-pixel tracking and you're not ever going to get that from a uh, virtual production camera tracking system. However, a match move and complicated camera moves can sometimes be really difficult to do. And so it, it certainly gives you sort of that sanity check um, by being able to, ha to know, okay, this is where the camera roughly was, even if it's not 100% you know, drag and drop. Um, but we also have a lot more camera data. And the, the camera manufacturers are all really on board with 
making more data available. Um, and there are committees right now, like the SIMT RIS committee, that's really committed to making that data available in an open format so that anyone can parse it. And we can accumulate all that data and you know, pass it along to Post, which makes their lives easier. We can also make use of a lot of it. For example, with lens data, we can use that to control um, the focus within the screen, the size of the frustum, um, even the exposure of the white balance, that sort of thing. Um, so it really is just nicer all along the chain. It's not, in some, way, in some ways, we make their lives more difficult because if it's a green screenshot, you know, they can just do whatever they want and that's fine. Whereas we are locking them into particular, at the very least, we're locking them into a particular sort of lighting scenario. Um, but as long as, again, you have the mentality of, oh, we have to figure this out ahead of time and we know, roughly know what this is going to look like, it is going to look better in the end regardless. So um, they may not, they may not feel they might, I don't know, they might not be as happy that they're losing some of that freedom, but um, you know, it will still look better in the end if, if you can commit to it the whole way down the chain. Anything else? I know this was a weird one. I know this was just kind of all over the place on LED panels, but there's, these, are, again, are things that um, people just don't know. These are things that people just aren't considering and that I think that they really need to. Um, and it's the same with manufacturers. I think that manufacturers need to uh, understand what, what is important to us. The other thing that, I, you know, last thing I'll mention here is a lot of times manufacturers will uh, assume that you're using a global shutter camera, which is not the case. So uh, obviously, in almost every case, uh, unless you're using a red Komodo. So um, that, is, uh, that is something to be aware of as well, is a lot of times they'll rate panels for particular frame rates. And it turns out, oh, we've, they've rated that for a global shutter. Um, it's not, it's not uh, what we're using. Yeah, quick question. So uh, obviously, we're probably all familiar with the more popular uses of virtual production with like Mandalorian and stuff like that. But what are some projects maybe that you've um, early on maybe uh, kind of like led people to be inspired to make something of a larger uh, virtual production that we might not know about? Um, yeah. Out of that. I mean, you're just uh, like you're looking for like just more examples of virtual production, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I think the work that was done on the Mandalor, or not the Mandalorian, the um, uh, Batman movie, the most recent Batman movie was fantastic. Uh, I thought that it looked really good, and that was ILM's own proprietary engine as well, um, which we're all very jealous of. Um, <laughs> it, uh, you know. I, as with anything in this industry, right? If you do your job right, the audience won't know you've done anything at all. So I'm sure that there are uses of virtual production that we've seen and we just don't know about yet um, until they sort of spill those beans. Um, I, I also, something else I find interesting is that we're starting to see productions that explicitly say we didn't use virtual production. So the Top Gun movie, for example, there was a whole you know, thing about them deciding, oh, we specifically didn't want to use LED walls, and they didn't like that look um, for whatever reason. So I find that interesting as well, because it just reminds me of like the, uh, you know, the VFX, when VFX you know, was not as good as it was today, practical versus, uh, versus digital conversation all over again. Um, it, and the result will be the same. We'll get there. You know, we're not, we may not be there 100% all the time yet, but we'll get there in the end. Anything else? All right, excellent. <laughs> That's all good. So, yeah.